It's a great pleasure for me to be, for the first time, uh, to have the chance to talk to the British Society in Nietzsche. And I hope this could be also part of it, strengthening the interface between the German type of uh, dealing with Nietzsche and the uh, Anglo-American way. I would like to, to go with you through these eight uh, little points and hope that I can give you some profile of what I think is an important uh, aspect in Nietzsche, which is the triangular relation between consciousness, language, and nature. Um, first uh, point, consciousness, language, and nature are fundamental topics in Nietzsche's thought. Careful discussion of them leads into the center of his philosophy. In contemporary philosophy, these areas of research are also of cardinal significance. After the linguistic turn and the dominance of the philosophy of language in recent decades, philosophy, especially analytically oriented philosophy, rediscovered mind and rediscovered consciousness. Consciousness has arisen as a key topic in contemporary philosophy of mind. Today, the triang triangulation of consciousness, language, and nature, more precisely brain functions, is the subject of intense and controversial discussions within philosophy, the neurosciences, psychology, linguistics, and the cognitive sciences. Throughout the world, people are working in and on research programs in attempt to solve the riddle of consciousness, that is, the riddle that arises from the striking fact that physiophysical organisms possess consciousness and mind. Physical, physiological, neural, biological, evolutionary aspects thus play an especially important role today. People speak, for example, of a neurobiology um, of consciousness, as Paul Churchland does and others, or even of a new physics of consciousness, as Roger Penrose does. Scattered throughout Nietzsche's writings, we find numerous reflections upon the areas of mind, language, and nature, as well as on their interconnections. That's the crucial point. Nietzsche discusses numerous topics in connection with consciousness regarding its genesis and scope, as well as the various epistemic achievements of the conscious subject, the ego. In all of this, Nietzsche appears as someone also, also wants to clearly demarcate the limits of consciousness and language, as well as the dangers associated with hypothesization of the consciousness and language model. But Nietzsche is not a reductive eliminationist. He's not a reductive eliminationist. He does not advocate the thesis that mental and conscious states and processes are ultimately identical with neurophysical states and processes which we, seduced by our everyday psychology, merely and erroneously interpret as independent mental states and conscious phenomena. According to the eliminativist conception, mental states do not exist any more than famous slogan than ghosts and demons do, as uh, Churchland puts it and many other people do. Nietzsche, by contrast, is a realist about consciousness and mind. To deny the excess, uh, existence of consciousness and mind and its role would indicate a failure to adequately take reality into account. It hardly needs to be emphasized that together with consciousness and mind, the role of language and understanding uh, of nature also occupy a place of special importance in Nietzsche's thought. At the center of contemporary philosophy, and now I say some words about contemporary, very roughly philosophy, to, to mark the place where Nietzsche can come in with his uh, reflections on philosophy of nature and mind and uh, consciousness. At the center of contemporary philosophy of mind lies the question of the relationship between the mental, in particular conscious mental states and processes, and the physical states and processes. 
with reference to the aforementioned riddle of consciousness, one can, greatly simplifying, formulate two theses that seem to form a dichotomy. First, mental states and processes are states and processes of matter. That is the thesis of a monistic materialism, physicalism of consciousness and mind. And second, mental states and processes cannot be reduced to a physio-physical states and processes. That is the thesis of a dualistic mentalism. Both theses together with their different variants, I do not discuss here, however, can be viewed as failures for the following reasons, and I give some reasons, the failure of that dichotomy, and then Nietzsche comes into the picture. Contemporary mentalism maintains that meanings of successfully employed signs are determined by the psychological states of the sign users. And here I use some arguments developed by Putnam and Birch and other people. This presupposes, however, that speakers can, by way of introspection, gain a secure knowledge of their psychological states and, more importantly, of the semantic features. And by semantic features, I understand meaning, reference, truth, or satisfaction conditions. Um, the semantic features of the signs they employ. Yet introspection very quickly reaches its limits. The meanings of our signs are, following Wittgenstein, not conceivable as the results of inner mental states, and we do not use a language in accordance with internally accessible and predetermined rules. The strongest version of the materialist physicalism thesis is mental phenomena are physical phenomena. That is, they are the states and processes described by neurosciences, by neuroscientific practices. <coughs> this thesis can also run, uh, also runs into significant difficulties. We should recall three of them that have been raised in the discussions of this approach. They are not coming from mine just summarize all aspects of the discussion. First, if two states of or processes are identical, they also have to have identical qualities. Yet, with, while a pain can be sharp, a sensation of color soothing, a thought exquisite, the neural states and processes that correlate to them are not at all to be qualified as sharp, soothing, and exquisite. A neurophysiologist looking into the brain of another person cannot observe thinking and wishing. Only certain observational parameters can be measured in this manner, for instance, the neural action potentials or the metabolism of the brain. The subjective and phenomenal predicate is sharp, and the neural predicate firing <coughs> of the C fibers are obviously not synonymous. Thus, the des desired fundamental assumption of identity is not fulfilled. Second um, difficulty, the identity thesis overlooks, in fact, overlooks the fact that in saying, for example, famous example, water is HO2, and analogously, the conscious phenomenon X is a, the neurophysiological phenomenon Y, the is in that formulation is not the is of identity, but rather that of a theoretical identification to use Pachin's expression. We are well acquainted with that. If someone sends you a photo, and then he said, this, it's me on the right side uh, beside the corner, and then if you make the mistake not to have in, in mind, it's a question of theoretical identification, but you put him identical, then you, my goodness, what happens to him that he gets such and such a way thinner that he could put him on the paper. So that, that's a very, very crucial, I think, uh, very crucial distinction. There are, so, there are implicit add-ons such as viewed under a, under a chemical aspect or considered under a neurophysiological aspect. And in that direction, the formulations are pretty, pretty okay. Thus, one must and that's the consequence, one must abandon the claim 
that we can express what is essential about all qualities of conscious and non-conscious mental states and processes solely from a neurophysiological perspective. Third point, with regard to natural materials and things in the external world, desks, tables, and so on, uh, it makes good sense to follow Thomas Nagel and Saul Kripke in distinguishing between what appears to us to be such and such a thing and what it is according to its objective way to be. A crystal appears to us to be solid and homogeneous. Physicists, however, say that it is a grid of atoms that largely consists of empty space. But when it comes to conscious mental states and processes, however, we cannot make this distinction. In these cases, the qualitative, phenomenal, and subjective state is its entire nature itself. Thus, one cannot, meaningful, one cannot meaningfully say that a desire is, according to its objective nature, nothing other than a certain state of the brain that a person merely perceives as a desire. This is a nonsensical sentence. If one wants to progress beyond these failures of the dichotomy between mentalism and materialism, physicalism, one must attempt, that's the proposal, one must attempt to change the architecture of the conceptual framework itself. Nietzsche's writings um, contain descriptions and arguments that are instructive with regard to the aspects sketched above. We will reconstruct, I would like to re reconstruct and discuss some of them in the following sections. Section 2. What we need is a non-dualistic viewpoint, an a-dualistic viewpoint, and Nietzsche provides such a conception. He presents a continuous spectrum of what exists and occurs from the most extreme limit of the inorganic through the organic up to mental states, consciousness, self-consciousness, cognitive and other mental activities and human action. The organic thus appears as the developmental and continuous preparatory stage of consciousness. Nietzsche's world is a world of such continual relationships. Man is thus, quote, not just an individual, but rather the whole organic ensemble of one particular line that continues to live, end quote. This thesis can be read either from the standpoint, from, from the standpoint of what has already been achieved developmentally or from the beginning of such uh, development. I'm just taking one of these uh, perspectives, looking back from the stage of development already attained, it means that the character of intelligent, spiritual, mental and living activities can be found in various degrees of realization in the organic and beyond. Thus, according to Nietzsche, the organic world always already presupposes and consists in, quote, continuous interpretation <coughs> processes, end quote. And hence always already presupposes and consists in intelligent activities in the broad sense of this term, such as identifying, localizing, perceiving, demarcating, classifying, and estimating. These are processes that in the broad sense of the term can be made applicable also to the processes in the inorganic world. That's a, that's a tough uh, thesis. Uh, this view also preserves, and that's, that's a crucial point, this, this view of a continuous spectrum also preserves the possibility <coughs> that the ego, the eye of consciousness, and especially the self of the human body, I would say a word later, can influence organic processes that it can, for example, influence the motor apparatus so that a particular intention or a desire can be realized through corresponding movements of the body, which seems to be a miracle if you do not presuppose that uh, continuous spectrum. In such cases, 
mental causation is obviously given. Mental causation, enormous uh, debate about this uh, topic in contemporary philosophy of mind. In this sense, Nietzsche thinks that it is necessary to, quote, retranslate man into nature, end quote, to naturalize man. But since the processes of the organic realm are intelligent and spirit, spiritual processes in the broadest sense, this program, the Nietzschean program of naturalizing man, distinguishes itself from both transcendent metaphysics as well as biologistic <coughs> and merely scientific naturalism. And at the epistemolo epistemological level, it is not simply the program that I like very much in uh, other respects. It's not simply the program of epistemology naturalized, to use the famous expression of quine. This involves a kind of naturalizing beyond the dichotomy of transcendent metaphysics and reductionist physicalism. That's a special kind of naturalization. In connection with the continuum model, uh, Nietzsche praises the, quote, precautious suspicion of Leibniz. Leibniz had assumed uh, there were pre-conscious intelligent activities, perceptions, what he called petite perception, which could significantly affect what occurred in inorganic, organic, and other life events without, however, having to enter into explicit consciousness. An example of such activity would be, for instance, the non-conscious and non-epistemic perception, to use Dretzky's expression, or registering of visual stimuli, which nevertheless significantly help to guarantee our orientation in the world, for example, while crossing a very busy street. Nietzsche's provocative formulation, quote, to what end does consciousness exist at all when it is basically superfluous? It's a question. There are two sides in this. It's not just the thesis, it's superfluous. That's, that's, uh, that's not the case, not at all. An important point, because normally people always talk about consciousness and the limits of consciousness and language without seeing that there is a very, very important and positive role to it. So in the evolution, to put it that way, and the materialistic evolution never could afford such bizarre things at our thinking about freedom of, of will as we had that uh, wonderful discussion yesterday with this, all the passion in it. And so it's, it's, it's unbelievable that it can't have any role within the evolutionary uh, budget, so to speak. So, uh, Nietzsche's provocative uh, formulation to what end does consciousness exist at all when it is basically superfluous, Nietzsche's answer to this question consists in the thesis that there is a rule, that consciousness is, quote, really just a net connecting one person to another. And that's an important and necessarily uh, given uh, uh, role of consciousness. And that is, it is only this capacity that it has to develop it. But this capacity is very crucial. It's not just we can, something that we can neglect and put aside. Otherwise, we couldn't even mark that point. If someone does neural, uh, neurology today and says, desire is mind cognition, this is just an invention uh, or an illusion that's interesting, he, when he's saying that, he will never accept that this is a sentence of illusion, or that it was his brain that wrote down uh, this sentence. He would always uh, say it was me. Open question what it's what it meant by me and I. So, third uh, point, a particular, a particular um, uh, process model. So the first thing is the continuum model. Now I focus on, um, on another uh, in my view, an important aspect, in order to develop a non-dualistic conception of the connection between the organic and the conscious, the physical and the mental, it is of the utmost importance uh, that one can, that one not conceive the building blocks of nature and life as things 
in the sense of material bodies occupying places in space and time, but rather as events or processes transitioning from the thing model to the event or process model is incredibly significant when it comes to addressing the problem of consciousness and the relationship between the physical and the mental. Conscious and non-conscious mental states and processes cannot be conceived within the thing model and its paradigm of material bodies. Nietzsche's conception of the world or nature capture is characterized by the figure of highly complex, and you all know that, dynamic reciprocal effects of numerous living and intelligent organizations of force. According to Nietzsche's new interpretation of reality, these processal, pro processual organizations of force are to be qualified as will to power forces. We do not need to go into the precise meaning of this characterization here and now. Um, the transition from the thing schema to an event or process schema is also reflected in the philosophy of language. This is another surface just to mark that point, consciousness and language. Following the pioneering work of Hans Reichenbach, analytically oriented philosophers of language, particularly Donald Davidson, have shown that the logical form of a large portion of the sentences of our natural language cannot be construed without the assumption of events or processes as genuine individuals. This is true, for example, of sentences that refer to temporal succession, causality, explanation, or action. The transition to a process model has important consequences, not only with regard to the status and the role of the thing concept. Think of thing as the crucial notion in traditional metaphysics. Um, but also with regard to the meaning of any talk of a subject. Consequence over transition, consequences for a subject. An important question is whether for each process one always has to presuppose a subject to enact it, or whether to use one of Nietzsche's formulations, the processes, quote, themselves have been. Since for Nietzsche only a limited portion of reality is present or uh, to or represented in consciousness, this question gains fundamental significance with respect to the relationship between the organic and the conscious, <coughs> the physical and the mental. Consciousness and the ego or the subject of consciousness appear on the scene <coughs> at the same time. This ego manifests itself in the fact that I could imagine, I could imagine the content of consciousness differently, sort it differently, and assess it differently without ceasing to be myself. Well, this is the appearance of the, of the self. By appealing to the event process model and by taking up the idea of subjectless processes, both the following assumptions can simultaneously be made comprehensible, and that's an interesting point, I think. First, that the ego or subject that appears within consciousness is already dependent on a network of, sub of subjectless processes. And second, that the state and phenomenon of consciousness itself rests upon an antecedent genealogy of non-conscious mental states. From this point of view, one could succeed in explaining how the idea of consciousness, that consciousness, the idea that consciousness has a subject, is compatible with the idea of subjectless processes. From here, and from here one can proceed to the famous question of Nietzsche and other people, Wittgenstein uh, among others, the question whether one can replace I think with it thinks. This suggestion, as we all know, stems from Georg uh, Christoph Lichtenberg, who had a significant influence on Nietzsche's conception of the possibilities and limits of language. For Nietzsche, it was, it was first of all important, the first point, 
that one not simply equates this new it with the old I, but, the further, but he further emphasizes that, quote, there is already too much packed into the it things. Even the it already contains, quote, an interpretation of the process and does not belong to the process itself, end quote. Here, important point, uh, the interpretative character of the operation comes into view alongside its processual character. Acknowledging these processual and interpretative characteristics undermines the fundamental role of the conscious and self-conscious subjects suggested by the surface grammar of the indexical word I. Even on a linguistic level, it is clear, and we can find some of these things in Nietzsche's Nachlass, which is very, very important. I, in the discussions during the last days, I had the impression the, the, the importance of the Nachlass into the subject is not really present in the discussions, at least uh, uh, in some discussions. So that, that's a very, and I think we should, we should work to, trans to have a good translation of that. That's an important, important and crucial thing. So, on the linguistic level, it is clear that process sentences, process sentences cannot be made dependent on a surface grammatical subject. We can see, see this in impersonal phrases such as X occurred, took place, happened. <clears throat> it is also manifest in sentences such as it rained, it thundered, or it thawed. These sentences do not have to do with individuated something that rains, thunders, and thaws. And what and where, ask that question, is the subject, for example, of a cocktail party? To ask who is the subject of the event is to miss the aforementioned fact that events or processes themselves have been, as, for example, in the case of a party. A party can take place in different rooms in an apartment. The ego, as a subject presuppose, that's a strange story. If the ego has to, to, to divide itself in different parts and just to go in second floor, first floor, and so on to go. So that there are very characteristic, uh, very uh, characteristic features about um, process sentences that cannot be fulfilled by the traditional conceptions of the ego. Fourth point, functional organization. I would like to, to emphasize and to, to emphasize another tr transition that from thing to uh, the uh, process model, the transition from the classical model of the organism to that of organization is of fundamental significance for Nietzsche's understanding of the organic and the conscious. Nietzsche conceives of the organism as an organizational structure. The organism traditionally has parts and they are integrated through the middle of the organism. This is the classical model. But this is not the organizational structures of competing and conflicting uh, uh, forces of powers in their constellation. So it's a very important transition from the organism model to the organizational uh, type of uh, model. Um, and Nietzsche conceives of the organism as an organizational structure in which consciousness, awareness, and all further mental states and processes up to and including conscious thought are emergent characteristics which result from highly complex interactions of the system's components that guarantee the organization's functionality. Thus, one can say that the initial stage of awareness, explicit consciousness, self-consciousness, and ultimately conscious thought arise as the emergent effects of an interplay of multiple organizations of force, the various organizations of wills to power. Such a view manifests a certain proximity to an opinion widely held today in brain research, and in that research center we have cooperation with people from Max Planck Institute in brain research and other people. <coughs> so, that, uh, in brain research, that consciousness and other mental processes, such as perceiving, imagining, thinking, learning, remembering, do not occur 
in a special localizable, uh, lo localizable uh, place or as Descartes claimed through a special organ, the famous pineal gland. In current brain research, conscious as well as non-conscious mental states are rather conceived as results of a highly complex organization and dy dynamism of entire complexes, more precisely neural assemblies. This view can also be connected to, and this might be a little bit surprising, but in the fragments of the Nachlass you find a, a number of hints that allow that uh, uh, step. Um, maybe this view can also be connected to the model of multiple drafts which has been developed within the philosophy of mind by Daniel Dennett. Dennett thinks this model provides an alternative to the Cartesian conception of consciousness, of which he calls the myth of the Cartesian theater. Descartes advanced a centralistic conception of the location uh, of the seat of consciousness and contended that the locus of conscious experience was the brain. For him, the pineal gland represented the center of the brain, as it were, the inner station, the central station, through which all sense perceptions must enter in order to be transformed into consciousness <coughs> of the individual through a specific transaction. The most important aspect of this concept is that the brain has a center and that is the causal point of departure for the emergence of the contents of consciousness. This Cartesian view of a special center in the brain that is causally responsible for consciousness and its contents strongly <coughs> influenced and even imprisoned reflection on consciousness throughout the modern period. Dennett approvingly cites William James, who wrote, quote, there is no cell or group of cells in the brain of such anatomical or functional preeminence as to appear to be the keystone or center of gravity of the whole system." End quote. On the multiple drafts model, by contrast, one understands that, quote, all varieties of perceptions, indeed all varieties of thought and mental activity, are accomplished in the brain by parallel multi-track processes of interpretation and elaboration of sensory inputs." End quote. Thus, according to Dennett, the information that enters into the nervous system is, quote, under continuous edit editorial revision. Under continuous editorial revision. I would say under the condition of being reinterpreted continuously. But for our purposes, what is of central uh, importance in the moment is the rejection of the idea that there is one and only one central perspective or one uh, perspective and one and only one inner center of observation and processing with regard to what enters into consciousness as content and what does not. With regard to the organic, it is important that the functional profile, the functional profile, of the whole network, whole network of activities, is thought of in Nietzsche as dependent on the multifarious interactions of the parts. Very crucial thing. This is not possible in the organism model, but in the organization model, it's, it's cardinal. But on Nietzsche's conceptions of how the organizations and uh, of forces function, this involves the idea that, very important idea, the dominant or governing, governing forces, that is, the predominantly organizing forces, are also simultaneously dependent on the functional partial forces and their constellations. Processual organization is, according to Nietzsche, the fundamental operation of everything that is real and alive. Life for him, he once wrote in the Nachlass, is to be defined as, quote, a permanent form of processes of force fixations. I avoid, he says, a bestimmtheit, it's not determination because these are not deterministic uh, processes, but it's a question of power to fix the relationships between these different centers of uh, forces. So life is, quote, a permanent form of processes of force fixations, determinations, 
where, the, where that's important, the various opponents grow unequally. End quote. These are the dynamic processes of organization that continuously take place within the internal structure of all organized beings and in all natural processes. The central place that Nietzsche accords to the idea of functional organization suggests that his conceptions could be characterized as a version of functionalism. I will not go into that. It's not the computer functionalism that Hilary Putnam invented and criticized. It's more the functional organization type of the, of the uh, will to power and the forces in their interrelations. Fifth point, the interpenetration of consciousness of language. Consciousness pr proceeds in and by way of presentations, representations, and meta-representations. And all three of these, in turn, are events that take place in and by virtue of science. Both of them. This is true of the entire spectrum from phenom phenomenal awareness of sense impressions and perceptions through imaging, remembering, conscious and reflexive thought, up to self-consciousness and plans of action. Thinking is an event that takes place in science and by virtue of science, more precisely in linguistic science. We can, as Nietzsche put it, quote, think only in linguistic form. And this is, all, this is not only a negative sense, it's, it has both sides of the coin positive and a negative, critical, the limits I will talk about later. Um, when we can, as Nietzsche puts it, quote, think only in linguistic forms and we cease thinking when we tend not to do it within linguistic constraints. Remarkable uh, uh, sentence, end quote. With this, Nietzsche propounds the dependency, the dependence of conscious thinking on the grammatical functions of language. Moreover, uh, every cognitive meta-operation also necessarily occurs within the confines of grammar. Since linguistic signs only carry out their functions or possess their semantic properties only uh, insofar as there is a practice of interpretation, there is no sign function without an interpretation uh, involved in it internally. That's now becoming a very crucial point. Um, here it becomes clear <coughs> that there is an interpretative ground, interpretative ground lurking behind the linguistic grammatical grounds. Nietzsche expresses this in an incisive formulation when he said, said that rational thinking, uh, quote, is an interpretation according to a schema that we cannot discard. And this is positive. We do not have to uh, forget the positive uh, aspect in this formulation. Now it is of fundamental significance that the internal connection with language uh, does, uh, the internal connection with language does not only appear at the level of conscious thought. Rather, according to Nietzsche, it even holds true regarding the genesis and articulation and the development of consciousness itself. There is an internal connection between consciousness and language, or more broadly, between consciousness and science. If one accentuates the public character of language and of sign usage, that is, the fact that a functioning language is internally bound to the public practice of using linguistic and non-linguistic signs shared with others, then the public and social character of consciousness also becomes clear. Language is a social art, is the first sentence of Quine's famous book, Word and Object. As we know, Nietzsche also points out this component. In this way, he accentuated uh, the semiotic character of consciousness. The internal connection between consciousness and language is extremely important in a number of respects. By directing attention to the link between consciousness and language, uh, aspects of consciousness come into view which have a different ontological status from the components already discussed 
under the rubrics Continuum Emergent Development um, Process and Functional Organization. The use of language and science are components that have their seed in the social, historical, and cultural world. They cannot be reduced to organic and neurobiological processes. This is a different type of ontology, if ontology is ever the right label to put it, but I, I, I let it uh, for the moment. This is particularly true of the higher order aspects of consciousness, such as self-consciousness, the experience of one's own individuality and the self-interpretations, for instance, of a free acting agent. And I said yesterday, when we want to make sense of the notion of person and person, and we kill these presuppositions of presupposing uh, internally a, a type of freedom, then we kill personhood and persons. So this is inconsequent and very dangerous, I think. Uh, evolution can't afford such a uh, such uh, things as denying completely uh, freedom of will, because otherwise there would be no persons and uh, acting uh, agents. So when it comes to such aspects, even present day brain research acknowledge that they quote, I quote from Wolf Singer at the Max Planck, uh, Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, uh, very famous in his sphere of the field, uh, that quote, they seem to require explanations that transcend purely neurobiological reductions. Remarkable sense for someone working in a research institute of neurobiology and um, uh, brain research. The decisive point is that consciousness and mind have now become thematized, and that's a very important point in Nietzsche, have now become thematized at the intersection between developments in the natural and organic sphere and the sphere of the social, the historical, and the cultural realm. I use a, a variation of that famous uh, phrase of uh, Henry Putnam's, meanings just ain't in the head. Here we might say mind and perception and other mental activities aren't just in the head. They, are, they have a public nature outside with other persons, and so a different ontological and methodological status. The occurrence and development of consciousness in the sense of awareness, self-consciousness, and explicitly conscious thought arise according to Nietzsche, principally because of the need, because of the necessity that individual human beings developed in relation to other human beings, quote, to communicate, to make themselves quickly and precisely understood. There is a need for communication, which, for its part, presupposes an ability to communicate. The subtlety and strength of consciousness of a person stands in relation to the, this ability to communicate, to the, quote Nietzsche, force and art of communication. <clears throat> in this sense, Nietzsche's thesis is that consciousness, quote, in general has developed only under the pressure of the need to communicate, end quote. Consciousness is, quote, a connecting net, net a linking persons to persons. Thus it has to carry out in, and <clears throat> thus it has to carry itself out in, important point, communication science. In this sense, the development of consciousness and language, by virtue of signs and simple functions, go hand in hand. But it is not only the words and sentences of language that perform the function of building a bridge from person to person. Non-linguistic signs do so as well. As example of such non-linguistic signs, Nietzsche refers to glances, gestures, and touch. The human being who uses signs but above all, invents signs, is in this sense always, quote, the one who becomes ever more acutely conscious of himself, end quote. This operation, these operations are ipso facto connected with sociability, for only as a social animal did man learn and become conscious of himself. He is still doing it, as uh, Nietzsche 
adds to that uh, remark, and he is doing it more and more to science positive and the danger in that. In this sense, consciousness in its characteristic relation to other people obviously play an important role in the processes of stabilizing social systems. Sixth point, uh, the relation consciousness uh, and body. Ego consciousness does not succeed in representing, distancing, or even suspending the network <coughs> of its own conditions. The cause, the ground, and the conditional network of consciousness do not arise within the space of consciousness itself. And nothing in the states or in the objects uh, that enter into consciousness reveals that they are dependent on a non-conscious network of conditions. But, there is a great danger of that, it's circling around in itself. But, consciousness, ego consciousness does have the possibility of opening itself up to the network of its own conditions. It has the possibility. There is no guarantee that it will take that possibility, but it has it to open up to uh, the network of its own conditions. This opening can be viewed as the transition from the lesser reason, kleine Vernunft, by which one should principally understand all modern forms of self-consciousness and the Cartesian style, which aims at fundamentalistic self-assertments, into the greater reason, große Vernunft, which Nietzsche, Nietzsche saw as residing in the human body and in bodily existence. The philosophy of body, or of bodily existence, begins, not with biology, begins where lesser reason reflects on, upon itself and opens itself up to the network of conditions that cannot be surveyed and entirely brought before one's reflective inner eye. The point is that bodily experiences enter into perceiving, thinking and acting as well since these are bodily embedded. And to describe the structure is, a, is an interesting thought. It's not biology, it's not a single science that does. Nietzsche's philosophy of the body or bodily existence must not, however, be, that's the crucial point here, be mistaken for a form of naturalism, biologism, and body organism ontology. I give just four uh, little uh, reasons for that. First of all, the avenue to the body problem does not lead through a single discipline, for instance, biology or neurophysiology, but rather unfolds in the course of reflection upon consciousness. Their bodily existence is conceived as a precognitive dimension of the possibility of knowledge, precognitive condition of the possibility of knowledge, as well as of biology or neurophysiology. Second, when doing philosophy, one cannot simply ask the difference to doing science. When doing philosophy, one cannot simply ask what the relationship is between the neural and the cognitive or the mental. Rather, one must always ask, uh, how should we, now that's the crucial thing, how should we think about the fact that such relations are reciprocal? In philosophy, we do not neurosciences. We do not open our brains and look what happens. But we ask, what are the sense logical presuppositions if someone does sciences, for instance, neurosciences, and comes up with uh, big sentences about uh, how it works and what's uh, the impact of it. And the third little point, the body or bodily existence. It's hard to find an English word. It's Leiblichkeit in German difference between körper as organism and Leib and Leiblichkeit is very crucial at that point. In English, it's, I think it's hard to, to make that distinction. I use the expression bodily experience or bodily existence. People try to translate by this expression also in Husserl's Leiblichkeit sometimes, a living body. So it, that, this is, there is a translation uh, problem which is in itself philosophically very interesting. So the body or bodily experience does not, on Nietzsche's conception, consist of building blocks that can be analyzed by a special science. 
It does not consist of something, something, uh, something at all, but rather, as was mentioned before, can be seen as the highly complex and dynamic interplay of multifarious small intelligent processes which become manifest as soon as we have bodily experience. And if we just add a little point that I'm particularly interested in, and I'll just say one, two sentences to that, when we ask what is the relation between bodily existence and, for instance, the meaning of language, words, and thoughts, the question is not, we have a lot of literature today, and embodiment and, and other things, the question is not whether there inside our body is uh, some special organ, the liver, the heart, the circulation of blood, that is the causal point of depart just for uh, the meaning, for fixing the meaning at the level of, of words, but it's different phenomenologically. It's not a question of science, natural science, but of phenomenological analysis of bodily experiences that enters into and helps fixing uh, the meaning of words. And you all have to have this uh, experience already that sometimes words are coming easily, for instance. And in other situations, they do not. This is an interesting point as to the relation between bodily experience and fixing the meaning and coming up. So the meaning, what uh, Jamblin, a uh, philosopher uh, 50 years ago, called in Chicago the felt uh, meaning, is something very interesting. The felt meaning is not just uh, the causal point from one organ within the body, but bodily experience has a shape of its own. It's, it's difficult, but I, I dropped that. The transition from the ego consciousness to the human body is also the, um, that means the open up, is also the tr uh, transition from achieved subjectivity to individuality. Achieved, the subjectivity that does and has always a job to do, it's hard to be a subject in this uh, tradition of the modern sense, to individuality um, uh, in the sense of that bodily organization which every one of us is individually. As a body, bodily existence, I am a living individuality. This allows room for the distinction between the ego of the rational subject and the self, which as body is still, famous formulation of Nietzsche, the master of the ego, according to Nietzsche. The critique of the concept of a rational and prefabricated subject by no means demands the disappearance of the individuality of persons, quite the contrary. Individuality is manifested in a non-reductive sense in the organization of the body or bodily existence, which everyone is as the interpreting being she is. Point seven. The power of language and science is great and extensive. Grammar and concepts occupy a particular place uh, therein. Grammar has a preformative effect both on the how and on the what of the conscious thought, and the latter has its limits in the form. What can be thought and said at all has to already have been prepared in the grammar of a language, Nietzsche quote. Thus, according to Nietzsche, it hardly seems possible to overcome the fundamental errors of reason petrified in language, such as the assumption of subject, object, substance, unity, identity, duration, cause, thing, purpose, being, by reasoning in language. That's the crucial uh, moment. In other words, reasoning in language does not seem able to avoid all these prejudices in which metaphysics, which for Nietzsche is essentially language metaphysics, relies. So metaphysics has a wonderful advocate, Nietzsche once said, in <coughs> and that is every word we express as well, uh, and every action we do is an advocate of metaphysics in that sense, because we bump into uh, that what can be thought and said at all has to already have been prepared in the grammar of language. Um, the limit of language. Now, the, these, here again, you have these words and sentences. Every word has a character of generality. Thus, expressions, for example, 
this spot of color are fundamentally incapable of completely grasping and representing the individual character of exactly this unique, unique and distinctive spot of color uh, on the wall or on the desk uh, right in front of me. Conversely, an expression such as Tower of Pisa can apply to many objects beside the slanted tower in the Italian city of Pisa. This character of generality is ineliminable, nor can it be avoided, very important point, because we think uh, Pisa, and then we try to add that city in Italy, in northern Italy, and that uh, shape of the tower and so on. So what we try to, to get on grasping position is that we, we try to add many, as many adjectives and adverbial modifications as possible. But the interesting thing is, the more you add, the more you come far away from the Tower of Pisa. So, uh, on account of the general character of all words, every word uh, together, uh, every word used for greater precision, nevertheless, uh, leaves the possibility open that many objects could legitimately be counted as satisfaction object of the expression. And even in the descriptive sequence of whatever length the inimitable individuality of the respective thing would never be articulated. When it comes to consciousness, this was about language and the generality character. When it comes to consciousness as well, Nietzsche cons continues to criticize the aspect that everything that enters into consciousness is translated into it and thus has the character of generality. Without that generality, we would not even have a sense of that individuality. So this is a, a double uh, crux uh, in it. With respect to human beings, consciousness appears to only to constitute a small portion of what humans are, and ultimately turns out to be something superficial, something that rests on the broader and more multifarious world of the organic and which came into being in the emergent and developmental determinate way. In this sense, quote, the world of which we can become conscious is merely a surface and, important addition, sign world. It's a surface and a sign world. Eine Oberfläche und eine Zeichenwelt. A world turned into generalities and thereby debased, but without having debased it, have an idea of that wonderful sentence in German, Nietzsche says that the reality is of unsäglich anderer Art kompliziert. That means we have no predicates to grasp them. The way it is complicated is separate from the grasping force of our predicates in every language and every thought, but we can say no more about that, and saying that depends on the grammar of language. To make the relevant point presupposes uh, uh, just language and science. Um, so I come to the, to the last point that is uh, what interests me personally, and I, I did some work on that, and uh, Cameron mentioned it in the uh, science interpretation of things. Uh, just um, a little, a small outlook, which is not the subject here uh, directly of science, <coughs> but a philosophy of science and interpretations as the basis of an integrative philosophy of mind, language, and nature. So I, I say just some, some words about that. Consciousness and, and language can be viewed and treated as taking place in science and interpretation by virtue of that, not only instrumentally by means of that, but by virtue of that. This refers to the genesis and the function of consciousness and language. The use and understanding of symbolizing signs is the most original, I think, fundamental characteristic of the human mind. For Nietzsche, man is characterized as the being that invents signs. Das Zeichen erfindende Wesen. Inventing symbolizing signs makes human beings unique. Inventing symbolizing science makes human beings unique, different from plants and crystals and also a number of uh, animals. Uh, 
mental, spiritual, and cognitive processes occur as processes of signs and interpretation. That's the basic idea I'd like to promote at that point. And this is, and I give two uh, distinctions. This is not, however, a simple endorsement of the idea that characterizes computational psychology and cognitive science today, namely that conscious mental and cognitive activities consist in nothing other than the operative manipulation of given inner symbols, that's the definition of a large part of cognitive science uh, uh, literature, <coughs> which computational psychologists pretend are each supplied with identifiable and exact meanings. That's interesting. If, if I'm right with the thesis that the uh, processes of science and interpretation are basic and fundamental, every well working cognitive science with that definition of manipulating symbols and presupposing exact meanings and interpretation of rules presupposes always already the theory of symbols and signs and interpretations. So it's dependent on that. Cognitive science is a secondary intellectual activity at this level. That's a very interesting point. So I go behind the back of the uh, cognitive science with that idea of a philosophy of science and interpretation. Uh, and the second point, nor does it assert a merely external dependence of the mind and consciousness on science and interpretations, for instance, insofar as thinking requires media and instrumental science in order to be able to represent and communicate itself and its contents. It's not external. The relation between science and interpretations and consciousness uh, and mind and language, the conception of language, is an internal one. It's an internal one that can be spelled out by different, uh, different forms and functions of science and interpretations along the line, how do symbols and interpretations function? One needs not just these external dependence, but one needs to take one further step and an essential step for precisely these processes that is, for instance, of demarcating, fixing, and delimiting meanings and contents of communicating contents between people standing in a relationship of communication. All these processes take place in and as processes of science and interpretation. As we have already heard, Nietzsche emphasizes, one stops thinking altogether, thinking in the narrow and in the broad sense. The narrow sense is linguist using linguistic science. The broad sense, I make a distinction between narrow and broad sense of thinking, narrow and broad sense of science, narrow and broad sense of interpretation. The broad sense of thinking is that the is just the pre-conscious type of awareness that we have in sensational, cognitively relevant sensations. So if you look at that, we can say this is not something that can be governed by rules of language in the narrow sense and the grammar of judgment but it nevertheless rests within the functioning of science and interpretation of processes. So um, Nietzsche's conception accords with that of pragmatism at this point, above all with the position of Charles Sander Peirce, quote, we have no power of thinking without science. Peirce emphasizes, and he goes even a step further and uh, writes down a wonderful sentence, I think, quote, when, so the first is, we have no power of thinking without science, and I would add to Peirce, it's not the Persian group, this takes place and is relevant in the narrow sense of science and thinking and in the broad sense that I sketch. Then it becomes uh, compatible with uh, what Nietzsche is thinking about. And then Peirce um, adds, quote, when we think, then we ourselves, as we are at that moment, appear as a sign. In Hölderlin, you find that wonderful sentence, Ein Zeichen sind wir deutungslos. That's it's at the very, very deep uh, level, just to, to mention where we can put the, the uh, sign and interpretation of stuff. That is, as someone who intrinsically already uh, depends on an underlying interpretation. In this sense, it is crucial that consciousness, mind, and thought are themselves internally and necessarily, internally necessarily semiotic and interpretative processes that science and interpretation organize and provide the basis for mind, 
language and nature, the dependence of consciousness, mind, thought, and nature upon signs and interpretation is not an instrumental one. It is not the case that we attain consciousness and so on by means of signs and interpretation. Rather, consciousness, mind, thought, and nature constitutively depend upon sign and language functions, semiotic and interpretative processes that are by virtue of which we attain consciousness and so on. This view can serve as a guide, and I tried to spell it out a little bit in the text uh, that Amron mentioned, as a guide for an interpretative, pragmatic uh, philosophy of mind, language, and nature, which transcends, and with that I come back to the, to the starting point, which transcends the dichotomy between materialism, physicalism, and mentalism, and I've tried to spell it out, but I will not apparently not bother you with these things. And thank you very much.